Hello everyone and today we're going to discuss uh, perioperative management of diabetes. My name is uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh. I'm a consultant anesthetist in uh, Liverpool. So the lack of insulin obviously leads to increased secretion of glucagon, cortisol, growth hormones, catecholamines and this leads to uh, hyperglycemia. It also leads to decrease in anabolism, which itself then leads to hyperglycemia, uh, which causes fatigue. It causes an uh, increased amount of glucose uh, in the urine, uh, glycosuria, and uh, this can also cause issues like vulvitis and uh, balanitis. And the greater osmotic load in the urine can cause osmotic diuresis and uh, this can present as polyuria and polydipsia. There is also salt and water uh, depletion uh, because of the diuresis and this can lead to hypovolemia which can lead to tachycardia and hypotension in these patients. Lack of insulin also increases catabolism which leads to increased uh, glycogenolysis, uh, gluconeogenesis and lipolysis. Increase in gluconeogenesis can lead to wasting and increase in lipolysis can also lead to weight loss and hyperketonemia uh, and it can uh, present as uh, diabetic ketoacidosis in patients uh, where the blood sugars are very very high. Acidosis can stimulate uh, ventilation uh, so there is hyperventilation and it has also causes peripheral vasodilation that can lead to hypertension and uh, hypothermia because of uh, loss of heat and uh, if diabetic ketoacidosis is not uh, treated it can uh, lead to death so this is just the overall about uh, you know lack of insulin and uh, diabetes and such but we here we are discussing about the perioperative management uh, especially in the surgical patients and uh, the Association of Anesthetists uh, came out with these guidelines in 2015, uh, which is uh, uh, the guidelines I have based my talk on. And uh, there was also uh, the European Society of Endocrinologists, uh, the Gerontological Society of America and the Obesity Society, which also brought out their own guidelines. Uh, for treatment of diabetes in older adults. Uh, so some basic facts about uh, the diabetes, manual diabetes. Uh, everywhere you will see me use CBG. CBG is basically capillary blood glucose. This is because we take the blood uh, from the tip of the finger or earlobe and so hence it is called capillary uh, blood glucose and that's what we actually measure. The blood glucose in the muscles is going to be different from the capillaries. And people get confused between millimoles and milligrams and uh, if we actually multiply the millimoles by 18 uh, that converts into milligram per deciliter. For example, uh, when I'm talking about uh, say 10 millimoles per liter of uh, blood glucose that equates to 180 milligrams per deciliter. So 10 multiplied by 18 uh, converts into milligram per deciliter. And this is important, uh, especially when you look at uh, the conversion of uh, glucose into the insulin requirement per hour. So one unit of insulin will drop the blood glucose by almost three millimoles per liter or approximately 50 milligrams per deciliter. The range is between 30 to 100 uh, milligram per deciliter on average around 50 milligrams per deciliter uh, per unit of insulin. So in the normal state, and uh, this is uh, a body which is not stressed, uh, the insulin requirement per hour is basically your capillary blood glucose in milligram per deciliter divided by 150. So if somebody actually presents with a blood glucose of uh, 300 milligram per deciliter, then divide by 150, that uh, gives us two units of insulin per hour. But we know that the insulin requirement in stressful states is actually increased. 
And in that case, the requirement of insulin per hour is basically your capillary blood glucose divided by 10, sorry, by 100. So if you have a blood glucose of 300 milligram per deciliter, and that will give us a requirement of insulin per hour of three units okay, per hour. So this is a simple uh, way of uh, you know, calculating what is the requirement of insulin. So if you look at the normal patients having insulin of say 180 or 200, so the usual requirement in anesthesia or surgery, which is considered a stressful state, is around 1.5 to 2 units per hour. So that's how we start off. Uh, with or if somebody got a normal insulin or blood sugar levels and say for example 80 or 100 then you just need one so that's why we normal starts with one unit per hour okay or 0.5 units per hour uh, people also talk about hba1c and it is said that uh, normally the hba1ac should be less than 69 uh, or 8.5 percent in the previous three months uh, for any elective uh, case or elective surgeries and that just uh, means that the blood sugar control has been normal throughout these three months there has been not very many surges in blood glucose uh, so it gives a overall picture of how the blood uh, control blood sugar control has been over the last three months so this is a very good way of knowing the overall control so you can also actually know what is the blood glucose, average blood glucose from the HbA1c. Uh, so if you look at uh, the uh, you know, HbA1c of 8 or 64, then that equates to an average blood glucose of 10 millimoles per liter or 180 milligram per deciliter. And so for the surgical patient, we're looking at in between 8 and 9, there's 8.5% or 69 and which equates to an average blood glucose of around 11 millimole per liter and you can multiply by 18 to get it uh, the milligram per percent so the whole idea is to ensure normal glycemia during the perioperative period and the targets here are 6 to 10 millimoles per liter or on average of 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter So the Endocrine Society uh, in 2012 also actually released some guidelines uh, which are also actually uh, very good. And uh, what they have actually said is that uh, even among non-diabetic patients, the older male with a high BMI and somebody who has a high ASA uh, class, uh, they are more likely to have perioperative hyperglycemia even if they're not diabetic. And uh, therefore, the uh, capillary blood glucose should be tested in all patients uh, uh, coming to the hospital on the day of surgery, uh, regardless of whether they have diabetes or not. And patients, uh, these non-diabetic patients who have blood glucose of uh, more than 140 milligram per deciliter, uh, they require further monitoring for 24 to 48 hours. And if required, we should actually, uh, you know, control the levels by insulin or other methods. So who are the patients who would require HbA1c test? So in the non-diabetic patients, uh, non-diabetic uh, in uh, patients, and these uh, patients require HbA1c, uh, basically the patients who have their capillary blood glucose, which is more than 140 milligram per deciliter. Uh, if they are diabetic, uh, inpatient diabetic patients, and if they have not had their HbA1c in the last two to three months before admission, uh, then it's a good idea to get HbA1c tests done because then it will tell you the uh, you know how the average blood glucose have been uh, over the uh, last three months. So it's a good idea. So the uh, pre-op HbA1c or the uh, uh, incidence of hyperglycemia uh, has got a, uh, you know, uh, its influence on the surgical outcomes. And what are the outcomes? Okay. So if you look at HbA1c, uh, if it has been less than 7, then uh, they are good outcomes, especially uh, looking at the infectious complications. But if a patient actually has a HbA1c more than 11.5, which basically suggests that the diabetes is not well controlled or poorly controlled, then the chances of infectious complication increases. 
So you, uh, you can uh, accordingly decide whether you need to actually have patients on uh, antibiotics in the post-operative period or you want to actually postpone the surgery and get a better control of the diabetes. If you look at the uh, blood glucose level, if the blood glucose level have been 200 mg per deciliter or more, then there is two-fold increase in the overall mortality in patients and there is four-fold increase in the cardiovascular mortality and the risk of uh, pulmonary embolism also increases because these are basically hyper or smaller state. Okay. If the blood sugar have been above 100 mg per deciliter, which is not a bad control, there may be a longer hospital stay and there may be a slight increase in the mortality. So we also know that the uh, high blood glucose levels and there is increased production or impairment of the uh, scavenging of the react, reactive oxygen species or ROS. And these are important because these are actually released by the uh, polymorph nuclear neutrophils. So increase in blood, high blood uh, glucose levels uh, causes dysfunction of the neutrophils. And because there is dysfunction of the neutrophils, there is decrease in the intracellular killing, uh, which will lead to decrease uh, wound healing and increased risk of infection. So high blood glucose levels, we know it, are associated with increased risk of infection, increased risk of cardiovascular mortality, increased risk of pulmonary embolism. And we also know that chronic infection or if there is a semi-urgent uh, surgery uh, because these are stresses on the body and uh, they can lead to poor control. Okay, we have seen that, that the insulin requirement is also higher, isn't it? It is uh, your blood sugar divided by 100 uh, in stressful situations. So you need more insulin uh, in these situations. So what are the goals, perioperative goals in diabetic patients? So first of all, the surgery in these patients should be first uh, case of the day. Okay, do it early in the morning. Uh, in some cases, you can do it in the afternoon, but then you actually have to make sure the blood sugars are well controlled, and we'll talk about that. Uh, how do you actually manage that? And you need to actually have a plan uh, to manage the hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, both. Okay, so it's obviously man management of hyperglycemia more important than uh, management of hyperglycemia because hyperglycemia is easy to actually manage. It's important to actually see how you're going to manage the hyperglycemia. So management of hyperglycemia would require, uh, in, and some patients or rather patients who are insulin would require a variable rate intravenous uh, insulin infusion or VRIII. <laughs> And uh, this is normally done in patients who will likely miss more than one meal. And uh, type 1 diabetes uh, without background insulin. Uh, poorly controlled diabetes who have HbA1c more than 6.9. Okay, or more than 8.5%. That means they are poorly controlled. And obviously diabetic patient requiring emergency surgery, which is obviously is more stressful than... Uh, the uh, uh, usual uh, elective surgery. So one of the things which confuses people is, is what do you do with the oral hypoglycemic non-type 2 diabetic patients who are on uh, oral hypoglycemic? There are so many of them, so different uh, type of oral hypoglycemic agents. What do we do with them? So in the oral hypoglycemic, we have insulin secreted goals. Okay, these Agents actually might increase the amount of insulin from uh, the pancreas, uh, which is uh, not producing as much insulin as required uh, uh, for the uh, the load, the carbohydrate load. Okay, so uh, here we have sulfonylureas, which are first generation and second generation, and uh, these are usually longer acting. And uh, the uh, I think first generation we hardly use them now. And then we have the uh, uh, mag maglitinides, uh, which are non sulfonylureas uh, repaglitinide or nataglitinide, and these are, have duration of action around 2 to 6 hours. So you will actually have to take them at least 3 to 4 times a day. And then we have GLP-1 agonist and the D uh, DPP-4 inhibitors uh, like sexagliptin, cetagliptin, uh, valadagliptin. So these actually have action of uh, 12 to 24 hours. Um, so uh, if you actually look at that, I'll likely go into slightly more details about GLP-1 agonist and uh, uh, 
DPP-4 inhibitors because um, uh, these are also known as the insulin sensitizers. Okay. So here you look at uh, the incretins. Now incretins, these are basically uh, the gut hormones uh, that are actually released uh, uh, in response to the carbohydrate load. So these are two uh, glucose dependent insulin polypeptide or GIP and glucagon like peptide okay one GLP1 okay these are incretins and they stimulate insulin secretion okay whereas they inhibit glucagon release and by doing this they lower the blood glucose level now the uh, incretins and uh, these uh, are uh, now inactivated by the dipeptidyl peptidase 4 okay so this inactivates that so if uh, this uh, is actually increased then there will be increase in the glucose so if you actually now uh, have an inhibitor for dpp4 okay this will block the dpp4 the, these are drugs and they will actually increase the level amounts of incretins and thus uh, lower the blood glucose so these are known as the insulin sensitizers so uh, citagliptin uh, ramagliptin these these are these are the uh, uh, DPP4 inhibitors or insulin sensitizers. Okay. Then there are drugs uh, that reduce insulin resistance and uh, suppress uh, the uh, gluconeogenesis. So the biaguanides, uh, metformin, is the only commonly used drugs uh, in that. And uh, we then have thiazolidine uh, uh, dions. Uh, these are the glitazones like rosiglitazone. Uh, pioglitazone okay these these are the uh, uh, drugs that reduce insulin resistance and suppress uh, gluconeogenesis and hence reduce the uh, blood glucose levels then there are drugs uh, which actually acts uh, in the kidneys and they inhibit the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 and uh, by doing this they increase the urinary clearance of glucose and hence uh, reduce the reabsorption of glucose back into the circulation and thus reduce uh, the uh, uh, hyperglycemia. And uh, then uh, there are miscellaneous other drugs. And so there are drugs that reduce carbohydrate uh, absorption. So some of them are like alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Uh, so they inhibit the action of the alpha glucosidase uh, in the intestinal brush borders. And this leads to decreased absorption of starches, dextrin, disaccharides, and slowing the absorption of carbohydrates, and thus reduce the postprandial increase in the blood glucose uh, seen with the meals. So uh, these are actually uh, some of the uh, newer agents uh, which are actually uh, into the market. So which of these uh, drugs we need to actually omit on the day of the surgery? So and uh, the drugs that need to be omitted, uh, especially when uh, fasting, uh, because they will risk increase the risk of hyperglycemia, are the miglitonides, okay, uh, ripaglinid, nateglinid, okay, these actually have duration of action of just two to six hours, okay. And then you have the sulfonuria, especially the second generation one, the, which are acting for almost duration of action of about 12 to 24 hours, okay. So the day before uh, the admission, uh, you're eating normal meals, so you actually take them normally. But if the surgery is in the morning, you're not going to eat anything, so you're going to omit these drugs. But if the surgery is in the morning, right, and if you're eating, then just take it, okay. But with sulfonurias, because they are long acting, okay, so don't take it, because their action, duration of action is almost, uh, 12 to 24 hours and some of them the older ones actually have action of almost 48 hours So what, what about while you are on the VRRI? So we have used VRRI intraoperatively and it is continuing the post-operative period Do you actually uh, start? So you stop until you start eating and drinking So once you start eating and drinking you can resume these uh, agents okay. Then there are drugs you need to omit because they increase the risk of ketoacidosis. And here uh, comes the, uh, uh, you know, the sodium uh, glucose transport to inhibitors and the uh, lepaglisophazine, uh, canaglophazone. So, zin, um, so uh, day of the surgery, you're still eating. So there's no need uh, for uh, the uh, drugs. So you, so you, you take the drug normally. 
but if the surgery in the morning you would not have eaten anything so you omit the dose okay but if you are actually having the surgery in the morning yeah and if you're eating uh, you've been allowed to eat then you can actually uh, you know take the drug as normal and it's same again if they are on a vri you actually only take the drug once you start eating so this is actually common uh, for all the drugs so then uh, the one which is actually on the right side that, that the patient is still on a vri then you don't actually uh, bother about uh, giving the drug till they actually start eating normally Um, in some of these uh, drugs, uh, they might actually you might want to omit in the day of the surgery, depending on the duration of action. Some of these drugs might actually have long duration of action, so you might actually also need to omit the day for surgery. So the drugs that may be continued uh, when you're fasting. Okay, so these drugs and uh, these are the insulin sensitizers, so DPP-4 inhibitors like. Cetagliptin, sexagliptin, halogliptin, linagliptin, there are lots of these gliptins. Uh, so these drugs, which are insulin sensitizers, and the alpha glucosidase inhibitors, the acrobos, these are the drugs that actually inhibit absorption of the uh, uh, you know, starches and carbohydrates. So obviously they can be taken as normal on the day before operation. Uh, in the morning of the surgery, uh, even when you're fasting, it's not a problem. And um, uh, if you say the surgery in the afternoon, if you actually eat in the morning, then just take it as normal again. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, as far as uh, the patients who are on VRI, uh, then you only start them uh, once they start eating. So uh, the acrobos and the gliptins, they can be continued as normal. Don't worry about, uh, uh, you know, stopping them. The other drugs that can be continued even if the patient are fasting uh, are uh, the incretins, uh, so GLP-1 analogs like uh, exenatide, diraglutide, lixinatide, and uh, metformin. Okay, so these can be taken as normal uh, whether the surgery is in the afternoon, in the morning, or obviously the day before you can actually start them. And uh, as far as the if the patient is in the VRI, you can still take them as normal, it's not a problem at all. The only thing uh, with the metformin is that you need to be careful, uh, especially if you are using contrast intraoperatively. And if the patient actually ha has a, a, a GFR, which is less than 60, okay. Uh, so that should be, then it should be omitted uh, at least uh, for the 48 hours, okay. The other group of drugs uh, that can be uh, continued when fasting are the uh, thiazolidine dions, uh, the uh, uh, pure glitazone and rosiglitazone, the glitazones, uh, they can be taken as normal even if you are fasting, uh, whether the surgery is in the morning or surgery in the afternoon, no problem with them. And you again resume them uh, once uh, you actually start eating and drinking, uh, even if you are on VRI, you resume them once they're eating. So the basic thing is that if the patient on VRI, uh, once the patient start eating, then you start your oral hyperglycemic agents. The agents, uh, some of the agents you might need to stop uh, uh, on the day of the surgery and some of them you can actually continue taking them and, and have uh, gone through them, okay. Coming to insulins, okay, so uh, this patients, uh, some patients might be actually on combinations. It's not uncommon to actually see patients who are on insulin but still taking metformin, okay. So in that case, uh, they can continue with metformin, like unless they actually have low GFR, or they're going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, contrast being used, especially in uh, patients who are having uh, surgeries like, uh, you know, uh, the endovascular uh, repairs, especially the complex one, they use uh, lots and lots of, uh, uh, you know, contrast material. In that cases, yes, you will have to stop the metformin at least for 48 hours and don't give it full stop as well. So coming to the insulins, um, yesterday I actually put a few questions on the group uh, in our uh, quiz, random quiz about who discovered uh, the islets of Langerhans and that the beta cells. Uh, so yes, Paul Langerhan uh, discovered that. Then we talked about insulin, how four people were actually involved uh, in the discovery of the insulin and there are also other people as well who were involved in the insulin. So uh, 
Insulin is actually a pro-hormone and then it is secreted and it breaks down into insulin and C-peptides. So you can also measure C-peptides uh, in the blood and the insulin as well. So there are obviously you have insulin and insulin analogs uh, in the body. So historically, uh, for almost more than 70 years after the discovery of insulin in 1921, uh, we were actually giving patients insulin which was procured from the pig or bovine uh, pancreatic extracts. And uh, these are no longer produced. There are some insulins which have actually gone out of uh, the circulation. These are Lanti, Ultralanti, Protamine Zinc Insulin. These are no longer used as well. Okay. So the human insulin which we are using, and uh, these are produced by recombinant DNA technology. These are very soluble, these are aqueous, so they are water soluble. They are at neutral pH and because of these reasons they are a lot more stable and, and they permit short term storage at room temperature. So even if you leave it, uh, uh, the insulin on the uh, you know, outside for some time, um, then it's not a problem, uh, they will still retain and their function. So insulin is a, a, a pre-pro-insulin uh, uh, which uh, is cleaved and you will actually see that the cleavage occurs at position 31 and 32 in the beta chain and this is important to understand uh, the insulin analogs. And so here we have the normal insulin, the A chain, alpha chain and B or beta chain and uh, you can actually see that there's arginine, uh, two arginines at position 31 and 32. Then at position of 28 and 29, we actually have proline and lysine, uh, which are substituted uh, with each other. So position has changed. So proline uh, has been moved to position 29 and lysine from 29 to 28 in li insulin Lispro. Uh, insulin uh, glucine, you can see glucose at position 29 uh, replacing the lysine and lysine replacing the aspartate at position 3. So that is insulin glucine. Then uh, you have uh, insulin aspart, uh, so aspartate actually uh, then replacing uh, proline at position 28. So these, these are some of them. And insulin detimer, uh, there is actually lysine, uh, which actually a modified lysine actually is used at position 29. And uh, for uh, uh, the another one is uh, the insulin uh, garagine, uh, in which uh, this is the only one which there is a uh, substitution in the alpha chain at position 21. Um, so there's uh, glycine being uh, replaced at position 21. So in general, uh, the insulins are divided into just two main groups. These are short acting and long acting. So the long acting uh, ones are detimer, uh, gargarine or NPH, uh, where the short acting was the insulin aspart, uh, glu uh, glulisline, uh, lispro and regular insulin. The onset of action of short acting is uh, are almost 0 0.25 hours and that is almost 15 minutes and the duration of action uh, is around three to four hours and uh, for regular insulin it's around four to six hours for regular insulin uh, for the longer acting insulin the onset is actually slower it's almost one to four hours but then the duration of action lasts for anywhere from 20 to 24 hours uh, for nph is around 10 to 16 hours then we have combination insulin circuits so this these actually makes uh, the uh, uh, short acting with long acting ones or uh, and uh, in different proportions so 75 25 or 70 30 or 50 50 or 70 30 and these actually have uh, the onset is as you know as uh, quicker as the short acting ones and they last for as long as 10 to 16 so that's the idea of mixing them and making them sort of a intermediate uh, kind of acting insulins that's so what do we do with uh, the patients who are uh, on once daily uh, long acting insulins? Uh, so if they're taking insulin in the evening and uh, the day before you reduce the dose by 20% even if they're eating obviously. And the morning of the surgery uh, you check the blood glucose on admission. Uh, 
Same thing if you are actually surgery in the afternoon, you still check the blood glucose in uh, uh, in an infusion. And uh, while they are on the VRIs in use, then uh, we continue at 80% of the usual dose. If they take insulin in the morning, uh, again, you reduce the dose by 20%. And uh, on the morning, obviously, the surgery is in the morning, and they take usually take the blood, uh, you know, insulin in the morning rather than in the evening. In that case, you reduce the dose by 20%, and then you check blood glucose as you would. If the surgery is in the afternoon, again, you reduce the dose by 20% because this patient normally takes insulin in the morning. Uh, so you reduce the dose by 20%, check the blood glucose, and continue at 80% of the usual dose. So that is uh, for uh, once a day insulins. Now, if the patient is taking biphasic or ultra long acting uh, by single injection, uh, these are given twice a day. Uh, so morning and evening uh, it's given. Uh, on day before surgery, patient is eating normally, so it's the dose is unchanged. But if the patient has a surgery in the morning, then you give half the usual morning dose and check the blood glucose. If the surgery in the, uh, is in the afternoon, you give half the usual dose in the morning dose, so give the usual one, and check the bl blood glucose in the morning, okay, so on admission. So, in these cases, because the patient is taking insulin uh, twice a day, morning and afternoon, oh, sorry, in the evening, then uh, uh, you actually give the morning dose, uh, half the morning dose is given as usual, irrespective of whether the surgery is in the morning or surgery in the afternoon. And uh, while the patient is on the, um, uh, you know, the VRRI, and the, you stop uh, the, until the patient is eating and drinking. Now, you, this might be confusing because you're thinking that, oh, what's this uh, thing about insulin and uh, infusion? The infusion is continued, um, you know, throughout in the post-operative period. And uh, you do give the subcute insulin and uh, then you stop it. And I will talk about uh, when do you actually stop and how you stop the uh, uh, VRI. Okay. So if patient is on uh, a combination of uh, uh, you know short acting and intermediate acting uh, separate injections uh, given twice a day, so they take two of that uh, insulin injections. And uh, on the day before surgery, um, uh, so the patient is having his normal meal, and then you don't uh, change the dose, it's the same. And on the morning of the surgery, uh, you calculate the total dose uh, of the morning insulin and you use the intermediate acting one. Okay, so you take the intermediate acting insulin and give the half of that dose and you will likely check uh, the blood glucose as normal. Uh, if surgery is in the afternoon, and uh, then you again calculate the total dose of the morning insulin and give the half of the intermediate acting one in the morning as well. So just as you have done with the, if the surgery was in the morning, same thing you do whether the surgery is in the afternoon or morning, nothing changes here. And again, you don't actually uh, give these, you don't start them on their normal subcut insulin uh, till they start eating and drinking, uh, even if they're on the uh, VRI. Now, uh, there are patients who might be taking um, uh, bolus is three to five times a day and also actually have a basal insulin uh, infusion. Okay, so uh, like an insulin pump, they might actually have an insulin pump. Mm, so day before surgery, there are no changes. These patients, they tend to monitor their blood sugars regularly and they will actually adjust the bolus uh, according to their meals. So they know that they're going to take a, a tea in the morning, then they will uh, with something to eat and they will actually give a small bolus. They're having breakfast, uh, they will actually give a small shot of insulin, but there is a normal basal insulin going on throughout. Okay, so these these patients, uh, so what do you do with the basal bolus regimen? So we omit morning and lunchtime short acting insulin dose, which is normally, and then we keep the basal unchanged. Okay. So if the patient requires a VRRI, then the long-acting background should be continued, but at 80% of the dose, the patient usually takes uh, uh, when she or he or she is actually well enough. So the uh, the basal, basal uh, infusion, and that need to be reduced uh, to 80%. 
And uh, if the surgery in the, is in the afternoon, uh, so you give your usual morning insulin dose and uh, we omit the lunchtime dose because patient will not be eating in the afternoon. Uh, the patient is going to be fasting in the afternoon. The, uh, normally in these diabetic patients, we da- uh, do try to let them actually have meals, uh, obviously smaller uh, amount of meals uh, if the surgery is going to be delayed. Uh, and then uh, we can actually use that. Okay. And uh, again, uh, so the, they will start on the bolus. Um, so the infusion, uh, the basal infusion uh, is going to continue at 80% of the normal. And once the patient starts eating, they will start using their normal uh, short acting insulin, uh, which they actually give us bolus. So this is what actually happens uh, when the patients are on the uh, infusions. So what are variable rate inf- uh, insulin uh, infusion, terminus insulin infusion, VRI? So I have already said what the indications are. So once again, these patients who will miss more than one meal, then in these patients uh, we might, and they have high blood sugars, then we might want to at least start uh, variable rate intravenous inf- insulin infusion. Uh, type 1 diabetes undergoing surgery and uh, who do not have background uh, insulin infusion. Uh, in those cases also we would actually start that. And patients who are poorly controlled who have their HbA1c more than 69 or more than 8.5%. Uh, in those cases or patients having the blood sugars of around 180 or more. And these patients uh, might require and sometimes in emergency surgeries, okay, so these can go on for long. We don't know what's going to happen. There might be major fluid shifts. So these patients are better off with a uh, variable rate infusions. Important thing is that the variable rate uh, insulin infusions uh, should be understood and monitored by someone who are experienced and qualified. Okay, so you don't want to actually have a uh, patient on this infusion on a ward uh, where the, the staff is not trained to look after them. It's okay in the intensive care or high dependence unit, that's fine. But if you're planning to actually send these patients to the ward, then it's not a very good idea. Especially if they are getting uh, both insulin and glucose, it's better that these patients are actually kept in a monitored area and they do not go back to the ward. So intraoperative care and monitoring are important part of diabetic management in this. And then the aim of the intraoperative management is to actually have a very good glycemic control and normal electrolyte concentrations or the potassium, sodium potassium balance. And at the same time, optimizing the cardiovascular function and real perfusion are equally important in these cases. They are actually like normal, what we normally uh, do day to day uh, patients. And uh, the other aim of the intraoperative care is to get the patient uh, back to normal diet and back on their usual regimen as soon as possible. And this is can be made only possible if we use multimodal analgesia, uh, especially use of regional anesthesia techniques so that these patients do not require opioids for management of pain, uh, post-operative pain because they are associated with and the, uh, you know, vomiting, nausea and vomiting. So that will disturb the whole balance. And it's equally important that these patients actually get anti-emetic prophylaxis again to prevent dehydration or not being able to actually get back on their normal meals. So these are important part of interoperative care. So interoperative management of diabetes uh, in a little bit more details. So first thing is the, what are your targets? Okay, so the, that's without knowing the targets is difficult to actually say uh, what, how or how you're going to manage this. So the targets for uh, the patients are six to 10 millimoles per liter, but we can actually shift this target a little higher uh, in patients who are poorly controlled. So you don't actually have to bring down the blood glucose level to lower limits in patients who are poorly controlled and can allow the blood sugars to be at least slightly on the higher side. Hyperglycemia doesn't kill, kill patients, uh, but hyperglycemia can. So you do not want uh, glucopenia happening in these patients. And monitoring of blood glucose levels are important. You actually can use glucometers 
Uh, the one it's shown on the top is the one we normally use. These are regularly calibrated. We calibrate them every morning. These are calibrated. Uh, or you can actually use handheld devices which patients normally use. But most importantly, you monitor the blood glucose before the induction of anesthesia. Then you do it regularly, intraoperatively. Um, usually we do it every hourly. Uh, but if the ranges have been you know, off the targets, then we might actually want to actually use uh, or monitor them much more regularly till everything normalizes. We do use uh, VRII, so that's wrong, VRII, that's VRII charts and doses. Uh, we have a different charts uh, in the wards, uh, but in the theaters, we tend to actually record the blood glucose levels on our anesthesia chart. So how do we set up a variable rate uh, insulin, intravenous insulin infusion? So there are two simple rules. The first rule is never stop IV insulin in type 1 diabetic malady. Uh, this melitus patients unless there is severe hyperglycemia okay because stopping can precipitate diabetic ketoacidosis uh, so even in patients who actually have low blood sugar we tend to actually maintain an infusion of 0.5 units per hour and give blood glucose to bring the blood sugar up okay you don't actually stop it so it has to be severe hypoglycemia to actually stop it Second thing, we never run insulin without IV glucose because if we don't actually have glucose, then that can lead to uh, fatal hyperglycemia. Uh, so this is our infusion. Uh, this is insulin and uh, it's running through an infusion pump at two units uh, or two mL. This is one unit per mL, so it's two units per hour infusion. Uh, this is a volumetric pump, which is actually using uh, 60 mL per hour uh, of this solution. Uh, so we have got 10% glucose uh, with 0.3% potassium chloride in a 500 ml bag. So this is running at 60 ml per hour. So the guidance uh, for setting up VRI, uh, we have our own charts. So we actually have to prescribe the insulin as well as prescribe glucose separately. And at least two uh, bags of 10% of glucose need to be prescribed. Okay, so uh, you don't sign all of them. We actually sign only for two glucose. And again, uh, with the insulin, every time you actually change uh, the syringe, that need to be signed uh, by the prescriber. So it is actually very strict monitoring actually happens. And there is guidance uh, within the system uh, how you actually set it up. So we use 15 units, which is just 0.5 ml of the ectrapid or uh, humilinus, and this is made to 50 ml. Uh, so that makes it a concentration of uh, one unit per hour. And it also say 10% glucose uh, with 20 millimoles of KCL uh, in final and back. And this is actually used. Uh, uh, so the uh, if it is a patient has got potassium more than 5 millimoles, then we tend to omit the uh, potassium chloride, obviously. And uh, we tend to actually run it around 40 ml per hour. And the starting insulin is one unit per hour. Like I said, normal patients and uh, the blood glucose is around 100, 100 milligram per deciliter. Uh, so the usual requirement is around one unit per hour. And we also make sure that the insulin and glucose actually are running in the same cannula. Because if we have two different cannulas and if the blood glucose stops, okay, then because of whatever happens to the cannula, then insulin will be going and then that can lead to hyperglycemia. And it again actually goes into what we need to monitor and how we need to actually monitor. So like we have said that we actually have 50 units, that is 0.5 ml of act rapid or hemolinous uh, in 49.5 ml of normal saline, and that's mixed to one unit per hour. And we start a, uh, the insulin at one unit per hour. And at the same time, we have 500 ml of 10% dextrose, uh, which also has 20 millimoles of KCL. Uh, running at 40 to 60 mL per hour through volumetric pump. And as I already explained, always have the dextrose and insulin running. Uh, we have the octopus, uh, uh, you know, attached to the, your single venflon and it has to run at the same time to prevent hypoglycemia. We need to monitor the blood glucose regularly and adjust the insulin accordingly. And like I have explained, uh, it's a simple formula. You monitor the blood glucose. If it is millimoles, convert it into milligram percent. 
you multiply by 18 you know, I guess that so if your blood sugar has come as 10 millimoles per liter and then become 180 millimoles milligram per deciliter divide by 100 that comes to 1.8 or approximately you can have it say around 1.5 to 2 units of insulin per hour and you monitor till you actually get a uh, stable insulin and uh, this is uh, the chart which is actually given uh, in our uh, VRI one so the targets is uh, here is 5 12 millimoles per liter and like I said in poorly controlled we can go up to 12 millimoles but the target is usually to maintain the blood sugar between 6 to 10 so if it is the blood sugars are between 5 to 12 then you continue insulin at 1 unit per hour but if the blood sugar drops to less than uh, 5 millimoles and it's not increasing then you can decrease the insulin by 1 unit per hour or keep it at a minimum of 0 0.1 unit per hour so you never 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 stop the insulin infusion okay if it goes about 12 millimoles per hour then you increase the insulin rate by 1 unit per hour so uh, starting at 1 you will actually increase to 2 units per hour so that's uh, usually a measure and 10 uh, percent dextrose like I said we need to actually prescribe at least 2 units at least minimum of 10 units of 10 percent dextrose okay and we need to actually measure the uh, capillary blood glucose every hourly and act upon uh, depending on the protocol and we need to change this even if you have not used a whole syringe you need to discard the insulin and make a new uh, syringe every 24 hours because insulin uh, can actually get absorbed on the plastic okay and uh, long-acting insulin should be continued as normal so if the patient is actually taking a uh, subcute long-acting insulin that should be uh, also be prescribed along with the infusion okay long-acting insulin should not be stopped okay so you do not rely just on the available rate insulin infusion you need to continue the subcute long-acting insulin as normal and continue to monitor the blood glucose uh, sodium and potassium levels uh, need to be monitored uh, regularly and uh, we check the UNEs that is UE electrolytes and uh, once every 24 hours and if the potassium is starts dropping to less than 3.5 then we actually check the potassium levels more frequently so next comes the management of intraoperative uh, hyper and hypoglycemia so obviously I mean this is uh, which we are already doing that uh, we are trying to maintain the blood glucose between 6 to 10 millimoles but at times we will allow the blood glucose to go about 12 in poorly controlled so if the blood glucose are constantly remaining about 12 then need to do capillary or urinary ketones and you look at capillary ketones and urinary ketones are normal then you actually correct high blood glucose with subcute insulin and, and see if the patient actually are on normal long-acting insulin okay so you can actually give uh, them um, uh, subcutaneous insulin after two subcutaneous insulin doses if the uh, uh, the uh, you know the uh, blood glucose is still high then uh, you can start uh, the VRI or you can alter the VRI accordingly so uh, I've already given in the formula for how you actually look at the calculations of insulin now if the capillary ketones are more than three millimoles per liter or the urine ketones are two plus then you actually assume that the patient is actually developing diabetic ketoacidosis okay so any patients who have ketones of more than three uh, blood glucose uh, sugars of more than 11 and on a blood gases if the ph is less than 7.3 and bicarbs are less than 15 then you start thinking of oh, diabetic patients moving into diabetic ketoacidosis I did actually talk about uh, in between about switching over to subcute insulin. When do you actually switch over to subcute insulin? So it's important that uh, once the patient starts eating and drinking, they can go back to their normal insulin. Uh, long acting uh, subcute insulin has to be continued irrespective. Okay, even when they are on uh, VRI, you need to continue the long acting insulin. Need to be continued. For the rest of the insulin, you need to actually have an overlap of at least 30 minutes. Okay, so you give the subcutaneous dose, wait for 30 minutes because, like I said, the onset of action of most of this insulin is around 0.25 hours. Okay, so 
uh, it takes on 15 to 30 minutes to actually start uh, peak will actually reach much later but the onset itself is around 0.25 hours okay so you need to actually have an overlap uh, of uh, the vri before you actually stop it so hyperglycemia in type 1 diabetic uh, patients uh, i have already explained that one unit of insulin will drop the uh, capillary blood glucose by three millimoles approximately 50 milligrams uh, per deciliter and so this you need to keep in mind so using subcute rapid acting insulin um, so you can use uh, these as no rapid uh, or hemolog or apidra um, so up to a maximum of six international units uh, can be used uh, in patients who develop severe hyperglycemia so if the blood sugar actually remains more than 12 millimoles of uh, liter and they have actually stopped the vri uh, then you might have to restart uh, the VRI after two doses of this uh, or increase the uh, if the VR patient is still on that then the patient's VRI doses need to also be increased. And the capillary blood glucose uh, need to be checked hourly and uh, the second dose should be considered only after two hours. Right, so as like I have explained in the management of hyperglycemia you actually just give two two doses uh, before you start thinking of uh, either increasing the uh, altering the uh, uh, restarting the vri or uh, start thinking of increasing the uh, vri infusion so this uh, rapid acting insulin subcute insulin can be used in patients who are actually uh, don't have ketones more than three in the blood or do not have ketones in the urine. So in those cases, you can at least do that. And what about hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes uh, patients? So here also, you can actually use rapid acting insulin. Uh, you can give uh, 0.1 unit per kg of subcut insulin can be used. And uh, maximum but maximum of six international units should be used. And uh, capillary blood glucose goes uh, again checked hourly and uh, the second dose is always given after two hours so easy to remember second at two hours two to two and if the patient still despite the second dose if the patient still remain hyperglycemic in the post-operative period then in that case you need to actually think start thinking of restarting the patient on vri if you have already stopped it or if the patient has never been on the uh, uh, vri then you at least start thinking of starting them on vri uh, hyperglycemia, uh, so uh, the capillary blood glucose is between 4 to 6 millimoles per liter. Uh, in that case, 50 ml, so 20% dextrose water uh, can be given, 10 grams. But if it is less than 4 millimoles per liter, then uh, you need to actually give 100 ml of 2%, 20, sorry, 20% dextrose water, that is 20 grams of uh, blood sugar, uh, need to be given. Uh, what about fluid management? Uh, the solution uh, is uh, to be used as Hartman solution. So uh, fluids uh, with uh, patients who are MVR, we already said that need to actually use glucose as a substrate because this prevents uh, uh, proteolysis, lipolysis and ketogenesis. We need to ensure optimal intravascular volume. Okay, so the patient need, should not be dehydrated. And we need to monitor the electrolytes and make sure that the electrolytes, sodium, potassium are within normal range. And uh, the iatrogenic hyponatremia can occur in these patients. Uh, so you need to be also be careful uh, with sodium. So you need to actually not only monitor uh, potassium levels, but also monitor the, the sodium levels. So potassium, uh, I already explained. So normally uh, we tend to actually use dextrose with with potassium uh, when you're using infusions and, um, and only if the potassium are more than five then we won't use it otherwise always give glucose insulin and potassium so that's why you used to call up GKI uh, the rate of fluids uh, like said we need to actually uh, maintain uh, fluids at around 25 to 50 ml per kg per day and uh, for a in a, in a 70 kg man it comes to around 80 ml per hour uh, we normally start around 40 ml per hour as far as protocol then go up to around 60 to 80 uh, depending on the uh, weight of the patient uh, sodium uh, is uh, like i've explained uh, low sodium can happen in that case uh, using glucose with uh, saline 
So half normal saline uh, pre-mixed with either potassium 0.15% uh, or 0.3% uh, that is 20 millimoles or 40 millimoles uh, should be infused uh, along with the glucose. Intravascular volume uh, and uh, so you can actually use this as a separate IV solution. So this is the second drip you're using and it's all it's important to actually maintain the intravascular volume throughout. Do not allow dehydration in diabetic uh, ketoacidosis uh, uh, diabetic patients. Uh, the diabetics uh, who are not on VRI um, avoid glucose containing solution unless the blood glucose is low and uh, avoid hyperchlorine metabolic acidosis. So what is the uh, solution uh, then left uh, to infuse? So obviously the answer is a compound sodium lactate or Hartman solution and that is the uh, or any any balanced salt solution and can be used uh, so lactates uh, do not get converted into glucose in diabetics rather they get converted into bicarb and which helps to uh, neutralize the acids uh, in the in the body the what about in uh, poor um, setting resource poor settings uh, how do you actually manage diabetics and in that case uh, Velo regimen uh, has been described and this is a fantastic regimen. So what we have here we have 5% dextrose a uh, thousand mls and we use a pediatric buret. So you fill this pediatric buret with 100 mls of 5% dextrose and to this you actually add the insulin per hour. So this is labor intensive. We will need to monitor the blood sugar every hourly and add the insulin required. So if the blood sugar is around 200, we will add either 1.5 to 2 units of insulin to that and red, and then run this 100 ml per hour of this solution. Okay, so these are uh, some of the um, uh, ways. So this is the chart. So uh, blood glucose uh, in milligram per deciliter and insulin in 100 ml of 5% dextrose water, which is infused over an hour. Okay, so if the blood sugar is less than 70, we will uh, stop insulin and infuse just the 5% dextrose to prevent hypoglycemia. And um, if the blood sugar is 101 to 150, that is the range we are looking at. So we add one unit of insulin. If it goes up to 200, then you add another unit to it, so it becomes two units. 250, you add another unit, that is three units. So you keep actually adding that uh, one unit uh, to that or to use the formula I actually explained to you. So what about returning to normal medications? Uh, this requires clear communication with the ward staff and clear documentation. Uh, like I have said, uh, for most of the oral hypoglycemic, they are started once the patient starts eating and drinking normally. And there is no uh, nausea and vomiting and uh, for the subcutaneous insulin, the long-acting insulin, subcutaneous insulin need to be continued. The shorter-acting insulins need to be actually given and you need to overlap the infusion uh, for at least half an hour. So don't stop it immediately after giving the subcutaneous insulin, just wait it. And, and continue monitoring the blood sugar. So once the patient is eating and drinking, then you can go on to the four-hourly monitoring. And once the patient thinks are normalized, then you can actually go to the normal monitoring, morning and evening uh, monitoring as the patient would actually normally do. And so that's why it is very important that the patient, if they are involved in their diabetic management and post-op care, uh, they should be told exactly what the plan is going to be in the pre-op itself. And in the post-op, then again in the recovery, uh, just uh, you know tell them what or when they can actually take their normal medication because these patients are going to be very concerned about what they care. And you need to actually also contact the specialist diabetic team if uh, insulin need to be started in especially in uh, non-diabetic patients because then you actually have to decide whether the patient actually need to go on insulin in the post-operative period on subcutaneous insulin. Or if there is dose alteration are required because the insulin requirements have gone up then I think their diabetic team need to be actually uh, informed. Thank you for uh, listening uh, to this lecture and I hope it has been useful for you.